Good evening, and welcome to tonight's program at the Commonwealth Club of California. As many of you know, I'm Gloria Duffy, president and CEO of the club, and I'm so pleased to be in conversation this evening with one of America's key diplomats of our lifetimes. Ambassador William Burns shaped virtually every major American pol foreign policy outcome for over three decades. From forcing an Israeli-Palestinian ceasefire in 2001, to managing US relations with the post-Soviet world, to responding to the Arab Spring, the elimination of illicit weapons production in Libya, and most famously, his leading role in initiating the back-channel talks, which ultimately led to the historic Iran nuclear deal. Ambassador Burns entered the Foreign Service in 1982. He served in many roles, both abroad and at home back at the State Department. He was ambassador to Jordan from 1998 to 2001, U.S. ambassador to Russia from 2005 to 2008, and finally, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, the number two position at the State Department. Secretary of State John Kerry praised his quiet, head-down, get-it-done diplomacy, stating that it had earned him the trust of both Republican and Democratic administrations. The Atlantic Magazine called him a secret diplomatic weapon deployed against some of the United States' thorniest foreign policy challenges. And President Obama said Ambassador Burns had been a skilled advisor, consummate diplomat, and inspiration to generations of public servants. After retiring from the Foreign Service in 2014 with the rank of career ambassador, since 2015 he's been serving as president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a policy research organization founded in 1910 by the industrialist and philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. It's based in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Burns is a graduate of LaSalle University in Philadelphia. Uh, he attended Oxford University as a Marshall Scholar. He and his wife, Lisa, have two daughters. In his new book, The Back Channel, a memoir of American diplomacy and the case for its renewal, Ambassador Burns offers an insider's view into the world of diplomacy. I was lucky enough to briefly overlap with Ambassador Burns in the US government in 94-95, when he was stationed at the US Embassy in Moscow and I worked at the Defense Department. He had the reputation among our colleagues at State, DOD, the NSC, and other agencies as a calm, steady, decent, and extremely competent U.S. official who could, could be sent into the most difficult situations and get the job done with excellence. We are so pleased to have him here with us tonight, so please join me in, in welcoming Ambassador William Burns to the Commonwealth Club. Thanks. Thanks. We're going to take a tour through many pages of history, many events. Let's I'll try not to ruin your digestion for dinner. Yeah, yeah sorry. No, no chance of that. He is that calm, diplomatic right, right. fellow. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about diplomacy at its best. You have written and talked about the Madrid Peace Conference mm -hmm. of 1991. Talk to us about what important problems diplomacy has been able to solve and why? Diplomacy conducted how? How is it effective? Well, I mean, first, it's great to be here with all of you, and thanks, Gloria, so much for hosting me. Um, you know, I deliberately started the book with a scene um, from the Madrid Middle East Peace Conference um, when I worked for President George H.W. Bush and Secretary of State Baker, um, because that really was the moment in my experience where American power and diplomacy were at their peak. With the end of the Cold War, the Soviet Union about to collapse, this was a moment, and I don't mean this as a statement of American arrogance, but where the United States was the singular dominant player on the international landscape. It was also kind of a plastic moment that comes along very rarely, I think, on that landscape. We saw it right after World War II, a period of profound transformation. We saw it in 1989, um, just after the end of the Cold War, and I think we're seeing it today in 2019. What made those first two moments, I think, you know, particularly interesting was the intersection of that moment of change, a moment of huge opportunity for the United States as well as challenges, and a group of people, statesmen in senior positions of leadership, 
who were quite skilled in understanding both the limits of American agency in the world, but the way in which American power could be applied. And I learned an awful lot as a relatively young diplomat working for Baker in those years. I mean, I learned you know, that diplomacy is about having a sense of strategic purpose, because both George H.W. Bush and Baker understood that this moment of American dominance wasn't gonna last forever. And they needed to try to use it to shape an international order, reflecting not just our self-interest, but our enlightened self-interest. Um, they also had a sense of strategic empathy. So, you know, which is distinct from strategic sympathy. What it means is you don't have to agree with adversaries or rivals, but you have to understand at least what animates them, their history, the constraints under which they operate. And you need a sense of tactical agility and persistence to be an effective diplomat. And Baker had that in abundance. And it, the persistence part, I think, was you know, particularly striking to me because Baker outside his office in Houston today has a whole wall that's filled with cartoons most of which were lambasting his efforts to put together this Arab-Israeli peace conference just after the success of Desert Storm and Saddam Hussein's expulsion from Kuwait. Um, it was denounced or criticized as a kind of quixotic effort, which was never going to produce anything. And yet Baker kept at it. I remember one instance where he had a meeting with the then bloody dictator of Syria, Hafez al-Assad, the father of the current bloody dictator of Syria, Bashar al-Assad, that went on literally for nine hours straight. Um, I had never been through anything like this. What it made it especially complicated is Hafez al-Assad, I always thought, had a surgically improved bladder. Because he would stand in a chair just like, sit in a chair just like this, and drink endless cups of sweet Arabic tea, and not budge. Now, Baker, ever the competitive Texan, was matched him cup for cup and didn't budge either. However, four hours into this nine-hour marathon meeting, our then ambassador in Damascus, a wonderful diplomat, cracked and invented an excuse about an urgent phone call he had to make. He did have urgent business, but it was not a phone call. <laughs> so then Baker and Assad, after he left the room, spent the next 45 minutes making fun of bladder-challenged you know, diplomats as well. So you know, that's not exactly a high moment in diplomacy. But, but persistence and perseverance is in some ways just as important as having a strong hand to play, knowing how to play it, is something that I learned from a master in Jim Baker in those years. Mm -hmm. Remind us what emerged from that peace conference. Yeah, Baker was quite realistic. He knew that trying to you know, reach a comprehensive peace between Arabs and Israelis, let alone Palestinians and Israelis, was not going to be possible in one fell swoop, even though American leverage in the Middle East was at its peak. Um, so what he set out to do realistically was for the first time to bring together in the same room the principal Arab leaders, the Israeli leaders, um, the Palestinians, um, around a common negotiating framework. And that was a really important first, and I think it created the opening um, through which the Oslo peace negotiations and ultimately the Oslo peace accord between Palestinians and Israelis occurred a couple of years later, and also the peace treaty between Jordan and Israel. And I've always thought to this day, because you know, leaders and personalities always matter in diplomacy that had Yitzhak Rabin not been murdered in November of 1995 in Israel, and had Baker actually served longer as Secretary of State, um, you might actually have seen, you know, pretty significant progress on Arab-Israeli issues, but those are all big what-ifs. In terms of the Secretaries of State you saw operating, I gather you would put Baker pretty much near the top. Well, I've been, I mean, I worked for five presidents, 10 secretaries of state. One thing I've learned since I left government is not to compare them <laughs> with one another. Because okay. they each, you know, to be honest, they each served in particular circumstances. They had different hands to play. They had different relationships with the presidents that they served. And that relationship is enormously important in a secretary of state's effectiveness. So Baker was as impressive a negotiator as I ever saw, he, you know, like any good poker player, knew when to hold him and when to fold him. And he was playing a really strong hand, you know, stronger than, you know, I imagine almost any Secretary of State has played in recent decades. But he played it with enormous skill. Both he and George Schultz used the term gardening. Yes. Um, can you 
explain what that means in terms of diplomacy? Well, it's part of the reason I think that diplomacy, you know, is certainly one of the oldest of human professions, but it's probably one of the most misunderstood, too, because, you know, by contrast to the military surgical triumphs, diplomacy is mostly about preventive care. It's about, you know, trying to avoid crises. It's about trying to garden in the sense of you're constantly trying to prune weeds or problems that are emerging to water opportunities and possibilities. So it's, you know, it's kind of a prosaic description. It doesn't look good on a recruiting poster, um, but it does capture, I think, a lot of the challenge, the day in, day out uh, hard work of diplomacy. I think it's similar to maintaining a network of relationships in your life where you maintain them, you never know when you may need them. True. And uh, the fact that you attend to them when you don't have to attend to them means that they were right, and, and here I, I'm not trying to lionize, you know, George H.W. Bush or James Baker, but, you know, one of the things that always struck me about the elder President Bush is that he spent an inordinate amount of time cultivating relationships, not because he was meeting with a foreign leader or calling that person up because he needed something on the spot. It was an investment mm -hmm. in a moment when he might have to trade on a relationship of trust. And you know, that's also a really important lesson for diplomats that the current incumbent in the White House might learn. So you rose to the top level, uh, just below the cabinet level of the secretary in the State Department. You served twice as an ambassador and mm -hmm. hold ma held many other posts. Tell us about your life path. How did you get there? How did you grow up? What, what, how, yeah. did you, how does one get into the diplomatic channel in this? Well, there's a lot of serendipity involved, you know, I mean, if you're honest with yourself about any professional path. I grew up as an army brat. My dad was an army officer. So I moved around the United States constantly when I was growing up. I went to three different high schools, first in California, actually in the middle of the Mojave Desert in Barstow, then in Oklahoma, then in Pennsylvania. The good thing about that was I love sports. Um, both especially basketball and baseball. So if I had a lousy season <clears throat> one year, I could go on and start over again <laughs> the next place, which was all too often the pattern in my sports history. Um, but I, I learned to really admire public service as I saw my dad as a career army officer. And then here's the serendipity part. When I was 18, uh, one of my best friends in high school's father became the U.S. ambassador in Egypt just after the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. So I spent four months in Cairo learning Arabic. That was my first real exposure, not just to the Middle East, but to overseas, and to seeing you know, the American diplomatic service in operation. And so you know, those, the intersection of those two things gave me an interest in diplomacy. I, when I was in graduate school um, in England, I went down to the old U.S. Embassy on Grosvenor Square in London, took the written exam, much to my surprise, passed it, um, and, you know, entered the Foreign Service thinking I'd try it for three or four years, never expecting I'd do it for three and a half decades. And so what were the steps in your diplomatic career? Where did well, you go from there? Yeah, well, I mean, to make a very long story short, I mean, I served first in the Middle East. Um, you start as a vice consul, um, which is, you know, where you help issue visas to Jordanians, in this case, who wanted to come to the United States. You look after, you know, Americans who fall into difficulty overseas. Then I worked as a political officer. I came back to Washington. Um, I served, you know, a number of, you know, really fine senior officers in the State Department. I worked for the Deputy Secretary of State in that era, a wonderful man named John Whitehead, who had been the co-chair of Goldman Sachs, was always bemused that in the State Department bureaucracy, things didn't happen as smoothly as he remembered them at Goldman Sachs. I remember my first day actually working for Whitehead. Um, he uh, was a great art collector and a pretty wealthy man. And he had uh, one of the miniature Degas ballerinas, which he kept on his desk. And I managed bringing a folder of paperwork in to accidentally knock it off the desk. Fortunately, it was a very thick carpet and it bounced. And I remember him looking up from his paperwork at me, you know, not entirely sure he had made the right choice in his special assistant. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I survived that um, and, you know, and then went on to a, a series of really interesting posts at the White House, at the National Security Council, 
Um, and then, you know, went, served twice in Moscow, first in the early 90s and, and then later as ambassador about a decade ago. Two very different Russias. You know, Boris Yeltsin's Russia, as you remember very well, a Russia in the 90s which was flat on its back, um, chaos and disorder dominating a lot of the landscape. And I've always thought, you know, you can't really understand the um, pugnacious, the almost smoldering aggressiveness of Vladimir Putin's Russia and unless you understand Boris Yeltsin's Russia and you know the combination of hope and humiliation in that period. So I was very fortunate in my career. So it you know there's been an image of diplomats as the guys in the striped pants and a somewhat elite core and I just like to put out point out that that was not your path that no. at least at, at that time there was a path for someone to take the foreign service exam coming from a relatively modest background and to move into the highest levels of American diplomacy. That's a very American story in a way. It, it is. And, you know, I've always found in the years I spent serving the United States overseas, you know, you get a lot farther if your diplomatic service looks like the society that you represent. And, you know, the truth is when I entered the Foreign Service in the early 1980s, you know, most American diplomats looked like me. Nine out of 10 Foreign Service officers were white. Only about a quarter were women in that era. Um, and we made painfully slow progress over the three and a half decades I served as a diplomat um, toward greater ethnic and gender diversity in the Foreign Service. You know, by the time I left, the gender proportion was roughly 50-50, although still woefully inadequate at senior levels, with people coming from all across the United States and all different parts of society. And one of the really unfortunate trends in the last couple of years has been to reverse that painfully slow progress. You've seen after 20 years in which every year applications to the Foreign Service rose, in the last two years they've dropped by 50%. And the challenge, as all of you can understand, is it's going to take a lot longer to fix than it's taken to break. So say a little more. I mean, we, we talk about the hollowing out of the Foreign <laughs> Service. What's going on with the American diplomatic corps, the embassies, the ambassadorial yeah. positions? Well, there are two kinds of problems, I think. Uh, and, I, and I guess I should acknowledge at the start that Donald Trump didn't invent the drift in American diplomacy. I think ever since the end of the Cold War, there's been a tendency for all of us to become a little bit complacent. We thought we could get our way in the world, you know, without relying so much on the diplomatic service. So it was difficult to build public support. It was certainly difficult to build support for budgetary resources. Then came the huge shock to our system of 9-11 um, and a tendency to further emphasize military and intelligence tools and treat diplomacy as kind of an under-resourced afterthought. But I would uh, argue that over the last couple of years that in the Trump era, the White House has accelerated that drift and made it infinitely worse. And there are tangible indicators and I think intangible ones. The tangible ones are pretty depressing. Um, I mentioned to you earlier the you know reversal of whatever positive trends existed toward better diversity in the Foreign Service. There's the pernicious practice of going after individual career officers just because they worked on controversial issues in the last administration, like the Iran nuclear negotiations. You have more senior vacancies in the State Department and in key ambassadorial posts overseas. This is two and a half years into an administration that I've ever seen before. Um, so those are the tangible problems. The intangible ones, I think, are just the broader disdain um, toward the Foreign Service, toward career expertise, toward public service in general that emanates from the White House today. When President Trump was asked you know, about a year ago whether he was concerned about all those senior vacancies in the State Department, he said, not really, because I'm the only one who matters. That's the diplomacy as an exercise in narcissism, not as an exercise in strategy and in institutions. It's the polar opposite of the diplomacy that I learned um, working for Baker, you know, many years before. And, and it creates real challenges because it comes at precisely the moment when diplomacy matters more than ever to advance our interests and our values overseas. The United States is no longer the only big kid on the geopolitical block. 
the rise of China, the resurgence of Russia. There's a whole series of overarching global challenges today. Climate change, the biggest existential threat we all face, but also the revolution in technology, you know, and the challenge of developing workable rules of the road to maximize the benefits and minimize the dislocations. There's a competition in ideas between more open political systems and authoritarian leaderships that really do feel the wind in their sails today. And, you know, we always get further, you know, overseas through the power of our example than we do through the power of our preaching. But our example, um, you know, is pretty tarnished these days, too. So there are a lot of challenges, I think, to, to diplomacy these days. So we'll take a tour around the world to some of the areas in which you've served, but I'd like to start with a question about one area in which you didn't serve, which is top mm -hmm. of mind today. Mm -hmm. That is the new steps, uh, frankly, to roll back some of the progress in, towards normalization of relations with Cuba. Yeah. The uh, allowing U.S. citizens to sue for the uh, expropriate, related to the expropriation of property and so on. Tell us a little bit about the steps that the current administration has taken, what you think about them, how they relate to the Obama administration's yeah. policies. Well, it's not going to shock any of you that I think the step you just described is incredibly foolish. I mean, I, it's not as if, you know, American policy toward Cuba for the 60 years or so since the Cuban Revolution, since Fidel Castro came to power, was a pristine success. You know, in many ways, I think we you know, offered a justification to the Castros to preserve a very repressive regime in Cuba um, simply because they could point to the enemy at the gate, to a U.S. embargo, to U.S. animus. And I think President Obama was right, and in a sense it was an overdue set of steps to take to begin to open up relations. Um, and I think the current administration's effort to roll that back is part of a pattern, I think, of foolishness sometimes that you see in this hemisphere and around the world. I mean, you know, the decision a couple of weeks ago to cut off aid to three Central American states in a kind of fit of peak over, you know, immigrants trying to come across the Mexican border in the United States, it strikes me as precisely the wrong kind of choice to make because if you want to diminish the tide of you know, people trying to flee insecurity and indignity in their own countries, you want to anchor them, help anchor them in a sense of possibility there. That's what you know, a well-directed uh, assistance program can at least contribute to as well. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm not undecided on the Cuba issue. I, I so you talked about, let's talk about Russia a little bit. Yeah. You talked about the difference between the Yeltsin era and the Putin era. Mm -hmm. What are those differences? Well, Russia, and you remember from your service there in the 90s, um, in Boris Yeltsin's time, was flat on its back. And, you know, it's, you know, it's always a kaleidoscope of experiences in Russia because you're covering 11 time zones, bless you, especially if you especially if you get out of Moscow, which is really important to understand Russia. But I remember in the 90s, you know, that kaleidoscope of experiences. I remember one day walking down from the old embassy in Moscow to the Moscow mayor's office, which was a five minute walk away down near the Moscow River, to call on the deputy mayor. And I'm walking down, this is in the middle of the winter, and there's these seven guys in business suits lying face down in the snow, spread eagled, and standing over them are these heavily armed guys in paramilitary uniforms with black ski masks on. This did not seem out of the ordinary in Moscow in that period. And I, this was the head of Yeltsin's presidential guard settling a business dispute. And this is the way you conveyed subtle business messages in Moscow in that era. I remember getting on you know, Air Dagestan one time to go from Moscow down to one of the poorest parts of Russia in the North Caucasus. Air Dagestan was one of the many dodgy spin-offs of Aeroflot in those days. This was also in the middle of the winter. So you go walking across the tarmac and on the plane, um, I'm watching literally as a guy is doing de-icing with a blowtorch. Um, and, then, and then you climb up the stairs past the pilot as I watched and he was kind of roomy eyed and he's putting away a half a bottle of vodka as well. So, and then I remember, you know, another instance where in broad daylight one afternoon at the embassy in Moscow, across one of the busiest streets in that city, 
some guy pulled out um, a grenade launcher and fired a rocket-propelled grenade which penetrated the sixth floor wall of the embassy, exploded in a copying machine, fortunately didn't kill anybody, but again, it didn't seem wildly out of the ordinary in Moscow. And then, you get me going on the 90s, it's hard to stop, but then I remember going down in the middle of the first Chechen war, the winter of 1994-95, to Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, um, and I'd never seen anything quite like it. 40 square blocks in the middle of that city uh, flattened. It looked like pictures or photos you saw of Dresden, 1945. Most of the civilians killed there were elderly ethnic Russian pensioners who couldn't get out. They weren't rebels. Um, and I remember, you know, when you're driving uh, into Grozny, seeing the Red Army that was supposed to be able at the height of the Cold War to get to the English Channel in 48 hours, that looked more like a street gang. I mean, albeit a street gang with nuclear weapons. But um, so it was that sense of disorder that I think in many ways animated not just Vladimir Putin, but the people around him, those professionally trained in the security services in the Russian military. And Putin, now it's almost 20 years ago that he became Russian's leader, um, was determined to restore the power of the Russian state and restore Russia to the table of great powers. So we used to call it the Wild East. It was, right yeah, then. no, it, and it's still kind of wild, but nothing like those days. So that was Yeltsin and yeah. the Yeltsin era, and then the Putin era is a reaction. What characterizes the Putin era today? Well, I mean, you know, Putin himself is a, a combustible combination of grievance and insecurity and ambition all wrapped up together in my experience. I vividly remember, you know, my first meeting as the newly arrived American ambassador in Moscow in the summer of 2005. And as a newly arrived ambassador, you bring a letter from the president of the United States to give to the president of Russia. And this, this meeting takes place in the Kremlin, which those of you who may have been there no, is built on a scale that's meant to intimidate visitors, especially newly arrived American ambassadors. So you, you walk through these huge ornate halls down these long corridors, you come to the end of one big hall, there are these two-story bronze doors. You're kept waiting there for a few minutes just to let all this sink in. Um, and then the door opens a crack, out comes Vladimir Putin, who, despite his bare-chested persona, is not that imposing uh, in the flesh, but he carries himself with a lot of self-assurance. And so he comes walking toward me, looking you dead in the eye, which is his habit. And before I got a word out of my mouth, let alone handed the letter over, he said, you Americans need to listen more. You can't have your own way anymore on everything. Um, we can have effective relations, but not just on your terms. That was vintage Vladimir Putin in my experience. It was not subtle. It was kind of defiantly charmless. Um, but it was pretty direct, and it reflected that sense um, that Putin always demonstrated, because I always thought Putin is, is an apostle of payback. He was going to get even for his conviction that you know the United States had taken advantage of Russia's moment of historical weakness in the 90s. I'm not trying to justify that view. I'm just saying that was his conviction. Um, and he was going to take advantage wherever he saw opportunities of American weakness and dysfunction and polarization, which is exactly what he did in the 2016 presidential election. In the two different eras, through the practice of diplomacy, what happened that was positive with Russia? Well, I think you, you worked on one of the examples of that in the early 1990s. You had a huge Russian nuclear complex um, that was deeply insecure. Um, and the United States developed a cooperative program. The former Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry, a wonderful statesman, um, did a lot to shape this, along with Glory and others working in the Pentagon. And I think that performed a real service at a time when nuclear insecurity could have you know, allowed all sorts of people um, to get a hold of nuclear devices. Um, you know, it ensured against that in that period. So, you know, there were a lot of, I think, positive things that happened in that period. But I think both we and the Russians had our own sets of illusions. We tended to talk past each other sometimes. I think it was almost inevitable that Russians, you know, given the humiliations of that period, um, would feel uncomfortable being the junior partner of the United States. Um, so there was bound to be a certain amount of tension when the moment came 
that Russia was back on its feet. I just never imagined that it would happen as, as quickly as it did. And during your term as ambassador, what, what do you, you, can you point to as a diplomatic accomplishment? Well, I think on arms control issues, we continued to make some progress toward the reduction of arms. You know, the United States and Russia to this day are still the world's two only nuclear superpowers. So, you know, however difficult our relationships are, it's really important to have, you know, guardrails in that relationship. And I think it's deeply unfortunate that what's left of that old arms control architecture is beginning to collapse today. And I see, you know, little inclination on the part of the current leaderships in either capital right now to do much about that. And I think that's deeply unfortunate. But we worked well together in that period on big nonproliferation issues, whether it was Iran, you know, in that era or North Korea. And I think that's also significant as well. A member of our audience wants to know about the impact of expanding NATO into the former Warsaw Pact on relations between the U.S. and Russia. It's a good question. I mean, sitting in the embassy in Moscow in the early 1990s, you know, I was paid um, to try to convey a sense of how Russians would react to the expansion of NATO in the first instance to include Poland and, you know, a variety of Central European countries, and then later the Baltic states. And what we tried to argue from Moscow, and you see some of the cables that I managed to get declassified that are on the Carnegie website, if you're really a glutton for punishment and reading cables. Um, but, you know, what we tried to argue is don't underestimate what the Russian reaction to that will be. I don't, to this day, think that first wave of NATO NATO's expansion um, dealt a lethal blow to U.S.-Russian relations. If I had been sitting at the embassy in Warsaw, you know, I would have tried to convey a sense of Polish insecurity, stuck for decades and centuries between the ambitions of Germany and Russia. You know, there was a reason that Poles felt insecurity. Where I do think we made a mistake was a decade later, in the spring of 2008, towards the end of the George W. Bush administration, when I was ambassador, where we pushed hard to open the door to formal NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia. And not just for Putin, but to, for some of the most progressive critics of Putinism in Russia. I hate using the term red line, but that was a red line. That was something that Putin was going to push back against. I remember another you know, scene where when I was ambassador and Condi Rice was the Secretary of State, she came to visit Moscow. We met with Putin in his dacha, which is not actually a small cottage, but a pretty big palace out in the forests um, outside Moscow, and had had dinner and gone through a whole series of mostly complicated issues in the relationship. And after dinner, we went to this small side room with a roaring fireplace. It was just Putin and Sergei Lavrov, his foreign minister, and Secretary Rice and me. And at one point in the conversation, Secretary Rice firmly but politely said it's really important for Russia to exercise restraint with regard to Georgia and Ukraine because there's a danger of tensions escalating. And I remember Putin, who's generally really controlled, I mean, he prides himself on this in his mannerisms, stood up in front of the fireplace and started wagging his finger at Secretary Rice. And his basic message was, you're the puppeteers, you need to pull back on the string of your Georgian puppet, who in this case was Mikhail Saakashvili, the then president of Georgia. Russians expect deference from smaller, weaker neighbors, and Saakashvili was passionately undeferential. And to her credit, Secretary Rice then stood up in front of the fireplace. Now, she was wearing heels, and she's she about five inches taller than Putin in her heels, so it <laughs> did not improve his disposition much to have to wag his finger looking up at the American <laughs> Secretary of State. So the tensions in that conversation de-escalated eventually, but Russia-Georgia tensions didn't, and in August of 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. Sadly, we still have conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Mm. Where do you think, what direction do you think that will go in? Is there anything the U.S. can do? Well, I think there's a lot the United States and our European allies can do to help strengthen a sovereign Ukraine. I think that's quite apart from the issue of NATO membership. I think a healthy, sovereign Ukraine is really important um, to the United States and to European allies. I mean, I think there's a lot that we can do. The Ukrainian government and political system gets in its own way a lot. It's, there's a great deal of corruption in that system, which Putin and those around him in Moscow can manipulate. I think from Putin's point of view, you know, what he'd most like to see in Ukraine is a deferential government in Kiev. If he can't have that, 
Next best thing from his point of view is a dysfunctional Ukraine. And so that's essentially what he's tried to do with the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and Russia's aggression into southeastern Ukraine beyond Crimea after that. So I wish I could be more optimistic that you know, the tensions over that aggression now five years ago are going to dissipate anytime soon. But I do think there's a lot we can do after the, Ukraine, the Ukrainians finish the runoff in their presidential election shortly um, to help strengthen Ukrainian society. And as I said, that's quite apart from the issue of NATO. <clears throat> this is a, a broader question, after which we'll switch to the Middle East. Oh, boy. Can the old diplomatic structure and process produce desirable outcomes in today's modern era? Can it keep up with the pace of technological change? It's a really good question, and I think the answer is that American diplomacy, like diplomatic services around the world, needs desperately to modernize. I think at its core, you know, the qualities of good diplomats haven't changed that much. At, at, at their core, this is a business, a profession of human interaction. So foreign language facility, uh, a sense of history, an ability to navigate foreign landscapes in the pursuit of your own country's interests are all crucially important. Um, but I do think on top of that traditional foundation today, you have to build a new set of skills. Uh, economic issues are increasingly important in the business of American diplomacy overseas. And the truth is we haven't integrated as well as we should have economic and more traditional geopolitical issues. Climate change, I mentioned before, a huge challenge, not just for us, but to, for the rest of the international community. You need people who are as conversant in that set of issues as people in my generation and the generation before were in throwing around terms like nuclear throw weights, um, and the revolution in technology. I mean, I spent way too much time in very senior positions my last few years in government, sitting in the White House Situation Room and collectively faking it with a lot of other smart people about issues like, you know, the geopolitics of data or the implications of artificial intelligence. We need to find ways to attract people with those skills into public service. The State Department as an institution also, I think, has to be honest with itself about the need for reform. I mean, individual American diplomats, you know, many of whom, as we meet this evening, are doing hard work in hard places around the world, they can be incredibly innovative and courageous and entrepreneurial. As an institution, the State Department is rarely accused of being too agile or too full of initiative. And so, you know, we need to delayer the institution, lots of things which, you know, which are long overdue as well. There's another aspect to this, which is the ability through technology to reach around right. and through national governments. I recall even by the time I left DOD, um, I was getting information from other sources that was sometimes ahead of what I was able to get through our internal yes. intelligence channels, just due to the internet at that point and so on, even even back then. So what role does diplomacy have and how does it draw on and live in a complementary world with all of the well, uh, non-governmental ways that relationships uh, occur today. Well, first is to be realistic. I mean, you know, the, the State Department has lost whatever we imagine to be our monopoly on access and in-state in foreign capitals. We're no longer, diplomacy is no longer just a business of governments, you know, where you march back and forth to foreign ministries. It's about connecting societies. It's about a whole range of issues. But I would argue that given the avalanche of information, the pace and scale of it in today's world, you know, what's important is to be able to distill it, you know, to anticipate second or third order consequences, to help make sense of it to policymakers in Washington, as well as the wider public, to answer the so what question. So, so what does this mean in terms of the actual policy choices that you need to make? And there, I think you still need skilled diplomats. And again, as I said before, diplomacy is a business of human interactions, despite all the advances in technology. And you have to have, you have to be able to make, you know, well-informed guesses sometimes, you know, about what's animating a foreign leader or a foreign political system. Mm -hmm. So let's move to the Middle East. Um, you, your first incarnation as a diplomat <coughs> was as a Middle East expert. Mm -hmm. You speak Arabic. Mm -hmm. 
uh, other Middle Eastern languages? Nope, just Arabic. So, yeah, and it's you hard start, enough. Yeah. You, you started out in Jordan. I did. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about your early service in Jordan and the issues that came up there. Yeah, well, I mean, Jordan um, in that time was a relatively, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Amman was a, a relatively small embassy. So it was a great opportunity for me to learn and not get swallowed up in a huge embassy. But I used to always tell um, classes of entering foreign service officers when I was the deputy secretary, I would meet with each of them, not to expect your career to get off to a rocket-propelled start. And mine certainly didn't, because I remember one instance I had been, I was the most junior diplomat in the embassy, and somebody um, had to drive a truck filled with communications equipment, unclassified, um, from the embassy in Amman all the way across the desert to Baghdad in Iraq. This was in the early 1980s, in the middle of the Iran-Iraq war, um, and I thought this would be a great adventure. And the administrative officer at the embassy had told me, don't worry, all the skids are greased at the border. I thought I could practice my Arabic. So I get to the Iraq border, and this guy who bore a striking resemblance to Saddam Hussein in his uniform um, looked at my paperwork and summarily tossed it aside. Um, so the skids weren't greased. I ended up um, being detained for a day and a half, kept in the cab of the truck, I remember. And then I had to drive under police escort the rest of the way to Baghdad. Um, I was released at the end of that. The truck and its contents never were. And so I spent the next 30 years in the Foreign Service worried that my pay was going to get docked for the cost <laughs> of the truck, which fortunately never happened. So I try to reassure junior diplomats that, you know, you could recover from early setbacks like that as well. But then I spent a lot of the rest of my career off and on in the Middle East. Um, I later returned to Jordan as ambassador. And I led the Middle East Bureau under Secretary of State Powell in the first term of the George W. Bush administration. Um, the most painful you know, episode of that was obviously the run-up to the war in Iraq in 2003. There were some other things that I think um, we did right and produced some tangible results. I led another uh, set of secret talks with Muammar Gaddafi in Libya in that period, which were aimed at, ultimately successful at, uh, persuading Gaddafi to get out of the business of terrorism and ultimately to give up a rudimentary nuclear program of his own. And it was, you know, Gaddafi was by far the most peculiar foreign leader I ever encountered. And he had, you know, a lot of blood on his hands. You know, one, one of my friends and former colleagues uh, when I served in Jordan in the early 1980s was on Pan Am, one, Pan Am Flight 103, which Libyan terrorists... Uh, uh, took down over Lockerbie, Scotland at the end of 1988. He was on his way home from Beirut to see his wife and two young daughters for Christmas. So in all those hours I spent with Gaddafi, I never forgot that. But he was peculiar, and his favorite time for meeting was usually about 2 in the morning. That's when he got his second wind. So you'd, be, you'd meet him one-on-one. -on -one at This one occasion was out in the middle of the desert. And he had this really disconcerting habit in mid-conversation of pausing and staring at the ceiling for three or four minutes at a time. And, you know, as a trained diplomat, you know, you're supposed to be able to carry on conversations. And I was at a dead loss in this. Fortunately, he was a snappy dresser. And on this one occasion, he was wearing what could only be described as a pajama top with photos of dead African dictators on it. So I would use the three or four minutes while he's staring at the ceiling to guess how many of the dead African dictators I could identify. And because he paused a lot over several hours, I got pretty good um, at doing that. But you know, that was, that was one thing I think we got right mostly in that era. We got another thing tragically wrong, and that was the war in Iraq in 2003. How, how so? Um, well, I mean, I think it was the intersection of several uh, strands uh, after 9-11 and that deep shock to our system. I think for President Bush, um, you know, there was a sense of mission of ensuring that that kind of attack on our homeland would never happen again. So there was a clear bias toward preemption and prevention. That intersected with a second stream, which was sort of the neoconservatives in that administration and the Pentagon, civilians in the Pentagon and the vice, pre and the vice president's office, whose view was much more ambitious. It was the notion that by toppling Saddam Hussein, you could transform 
the Arab world, you could plant the seeds of democracy, a view that was untethered to history in my experience, because my generation of Middle East experts um, had lived through the United States um, kind of bungling its way into a sectarian war in Lebanon in the 1980s, um, which turned out to be a huge mistake for the United States. And then there was a third strand, which was not so much neoconservative as paleoconservative, <laughs> which I always associate with Vice President Cheney and Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, which held that toppling the Taliban in Afghanistan after 9-11 was necessary but not sufficient. If you really wanted to send a strong signal to terrorists in any state that would sponsor them, you needed to accomplish something bigger. And of course, Saddam Hussein was the all too tempting target for that. Uh, I, you know, my colleagues and I in the Near East Bureau um, thought that the assumptions that were underpinning what we believed to be a rush to war were recklessly rosy. And I remember we sat down in the summer of 2002 in what was the most depressing brainstorming session of my entire career. Two colleagues of mine and I, both extremely um, thoughtful and experienced in the Middle East. And we tried to list for Colin Powell, who hardly needed convincing, all the things we thought could go wrong after Saddam was toppled. Because we always thought that the military challenge of taking down the Iraqi regime was in a sense the easy part. The hard part was gonna be the day after, given the complexities of that society and what you would in effect own um, if you toppled Saddam Hussein. And so we called this note, it was really less a coherent memo than a kind of hurried list of horribles. Um, we called it the perfect storm. Um, and you know, you, right, we, if you reread it today and it's also online, you know, we got it about half right. You know, we anticipated some of the things that could go wrong, but we missed others or we exaggerated others. But I mention it only because it was an, an imperfect effort, but an honest effort at least, to describe, you know, to lay out our concerns. Um, and to this day, I regret that I did not do that as effectively as I should have. Um, because, you know, I think that invasion of Iraq produced truly catastrophic consequences for the United States and the Middle East and for lots of people in the Middle East. And I say that not because I wasn't convinced that Iraqis would be better off with Saddam Hussein, the bloody dictator, but because if you don't carefully match ends to means, you can, you know, you can create an enormous loss of American blood and treasure. And you can take the dysfunction of the Middle East uh, and make it a lot worse. And that's basically what we did. So when you are a diplomat, when you work for the U.S. government, you put in your views. Yes. You give it all you can. You try to shift policy in the direction you feel is important. Sometimes it doesn't work. Right. So how do you think about that? How do you handle that? Well, those are really hard choices. I mean, in a disciplined uh, public service, whether it's the military or civilian services like American diplomats, you know, discipline is important. You can't have brigade commanders in the U.S. Army who, when faced with a lawful order, say, I'd really rather turn left than turn right. You, you can't conduct yourselves that way. So discipline is important. But there are a lot of times honorable officers in the Foreign Service um, you know, come to the point where they cannot in good conscience um, implement or carry out a policy. So I have enormous respect. There were 20 or so you know, career officers in the State Department who resigned over policy in the Balkans in the 1990s. There were three, as I recall, over Iraq in 2003. There are many more than that in the last couple of years in the Trump administration who have resigned, um, in large part because they just couldn't, in, in good conscience, carry out policies. That is an enormously honorable step to take. I think it is also honorable, however difficult it is to come to grips with this, to continue to serve, but only if you recognize that there's an equally important obligation to be honest about your concerns, even when it's not convenient. And any institution, especially the State Department, that doesn't encourage an atmosphere in which people feel not only that they're free to be honest, but they have an obligation to be honest, is gonna be an institution which makes bad choices. 
Um, and I, to this day, I'm not sure that I made the right choice in 2003. As I said, I could have been a lot more effective in expressing my concerns. Um, you inevitably feel like an enabler in situations like that. But I also think you do need people who are going to continue to serve whatever the administration and do the best that they can. Um, but it's absolutely essential that they be honest. So let's turn to Saudi Arabia. Oh. and the royal family, and the way that the U.S. is treating instances of human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us what you think about that, and how should we be handling these very difficult situations? Yeah, and, and I, I should acknowledge at the start that, again, I don't exactly have a pristine record in helping to manage U.S. relations with authoritarian regimes in the Middle East. Um, there are some painful trade-offs that inevitably get made when you have a you know, an imminent counterterrorism concern, and yet you're dealing with a government which abuses human rights or at least ignores um, human rights standards that matter to us. What I do believe is that it's really important, however difficult the trade-offs, not to check your values at the door, which is what I fear is, is happening in this administration. And I think Saudi Arabia is a classic example of that. We do no favors to the future of Saudi Arabia, its stability, if we pull our punches on issues of overreach, whether it's issues of overreach in the region, an absolutely catastrophic war in Yemen today, which is, you know, in which literally tens of thousands of Yemeni civilians are being killed, um, which needs to end. And I think the United States, as a friend of Saudi Arabia, ought to be honest about that. And it needs to be a two-way street. I think it's equally important to be honest where there's overreach in terms of domestic repression. I mean, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist who was killed in a Saudi diplomatic facility uh, in Istanbul, um, or in, in, in Turkey, um, is you know, it is something that we need to take really seriously. And I, and I think in a sense what we've done is indulged um, the Saudi regime and Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia today. Um, as I said, I don't think that does any favors um, to the future of Saudi Arabia to pull our punches um, on issues like that. Um, so... Um, what should we be doing? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's not... You know, we say we're going to hold people to account for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, you know, I don't know that we're ever going to be able to hold the crown prince of Saudi Arabia to account for that. But what we certainly should do is push much harder at a moment when he's backpedaling a little bit to stop the war in Yemen, to release, you know, the peaceful um, dissidents in Saudi Arabia, many of them women who have been detained in Saudi Arabia, um, to stop what is a silly contest um, with uh, Qatar uh, today in the Gulf, which in a sense, you know, make it, makes it easier for the Iranians to divide Gulf Arab states. I mean, those are the things that I think we should push quite hard on. Um, you were very instrumental in bringing about the uh, negotiations with Iran uh, that led to the Iran nuclear agreement. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that came about and your role. Sure. Well, I mean, it's a long story in the sense that Iran, you know, as a challenge hung over, you know, most of my diplomatic career. I took the, the written exam for the Foreign Service, as I mentioned, in London in the November of 1979, I think, the same week that our diplomats were taken hostage in Tehran. So I was a little slow on the uptake in terms of the risk involved in diplomacy. But, you know, and then I lived as a young diplomat through a period in the 1980s where Iranian-backed militias were responsible for killing 63 of my colleagues at our embassy in Beirut, 240-some Marines at a barracks outside Beirut. You know, it's a painful period, and the Iranians have their own grievances about the United States and the Reagan era putting our thumb on the scale in favor of Saddam and the Iraqis against the Iranians in a brutal war in which, you know, uh, tens of thousands of Iranians were gassed at the front lines by the Iraqis. So there was a lot of baggage on both sides. But by the time I came back from Moscow <clears throat> to be the number three in the State Department in the spring of 2008, I, I was convinced that we needed to test after you know, years of, of war in the Middle East whether diplomacy could produce a practical result in dealing what was the most imminent threat anyway, not the only threat, but the most imminent one 
that the Iranian regime posed, which was an unconstrained nuclear program and the danger that Iran would develop a nuclear weapon. So beginning at the very end of the George W. Bush administration with the support of Secretary of State Rice, you know, I was allowed to join the international negotiators because we had stayed away from the negotiating table up until that point. And I remember <clears throat> sending a note back to Secretary Rice after the first such meeting in Geneva in July, I think, of 2008, um, which went on for six hours, and you know the Iranians were pretty dug in and were determined to evade any real engagement in that period. And sending a note back to Secretary Rice saying, you know, maybe we haven't missed all that much over the years. Um, but then came the Obama administration and a much more ambitious effort um, to see whether diplomacy could produce a negotiated outcome. We spent much of the first term <clears throat> both testing Iranian intentions, but also investing in a wider coalition of countries. When the Iranians, at least in those years, 2009 through 2012, didn't appear ready for a serious negotiation, we used that, our willingness to engage, we weren't the problem, um, to persuade not just our European allies, but the Russians and Chinese to step up economic pressure against Iran, not as an end in itself, but as a means to produce a serious negotiation. So fast forward to the beginning of the second term, early 2013, Iran's oil exports had dropped by 50%, the value of its currency had dropped by 50%. President Obama decided that we would test direct negotiations with the Iranians bilaterally, secretly. Um, and I think that was the right call. It was kind of, it, later turned out to be controversial, but given the baggage on both sides, it would have been very difficult, I think, to get any traction in negotiations if we were doing it in the glare of publicity. It would have been too easy in both capitals to blow it up on the launch pad. So we did this in Oman. Uh, the Omanis were very good facilitators in negotiations, a deserted Omani military officer's rest house on the Arabian Sea the temperature about 130 degrees Fahrenheit outside. There wasn't much to do other than Amer Americans and Iranians talking to one another. And we made actually more rapid progress than I anticipated through nine or 10 sessions in the secret talks. We put together what was later <clears throat> embraced by international partners and formalized an interim agreement that froze their nuclear program, rolled it back in some significant respects, imposed quite unprecedented uh, verification and monitoring measures, all in return for very modest sanctions relief, because we wanted to preserve most of our leverage for the later comprehensive talks. Um, it wasn't a perfect agreement, but perfect is rarely on the menu in diplomacy. It was the best of the available alternatives um, for preventing the Iranians from developing a nuclear weapon. Um, and to this day, I'm convinced of that. And I think it was an historic mistake for President Trump to bail out of that agreement. I think it, it fits a pattern of retreat from you know international agreements, the Paris Climate Treaty, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the big trade agreement in Asia, which undermines our credibility in the world, which can be an overused term in Washington, but it does matter if you wanna get people to negotiate seriously with you. I think it creates fertile soil for collisions between us and the Iranians and other players in the Middle East and the Iranians that can escalate very quickly. And I worry <clears throat> that in this administration, um, we may not be able to manage that escalation very well. And there are gonna be some people who aren't gonna to wanna to manage the escalation because I think while the administration argues that the goal here is a better nuclear deal, I think the real goal is either the you know, capitulation of the Iranian leadership or its implosion. And, and again, as I said before, I think that aim is not tethered to history as, as I've understood it. And it can lead to collisions which get very difficult to manage. It's widening the fissure between us and our closest European allies, in a sense doing Vladimir Putin's work for him. Um, and I think it's eroding the utility of sanctions over time. You know, we've not always used sanctions well, we've overdone it sometimes, but they can be a very effective tool of American foreign policy and certainly better than the use of force if you can use it effectively. But you know, a year ago you had the foreign minister of Germany, one of our closest allies stand up and say, you know, all of us need to reduce our vulnerability to the American financial system. And so it won't happen overnight or next year, but you know, we'll wake up four or five years from now and find that sanctions aren't as an effective tool as we once thought they were. So I've had the good fortune 
to be hosted to work inside of American embassies. Mm -hmm. As a DOD official, you guys were very kind. And uh, so I have a, some sense of what the daily routines mm -hmm. are and what life looks like. I'm not sure a lot of people can envision. Mm -hmm. So as an American ambassador in Jordan, in Moscow, you get up in the morning, and then what happens? What's your day like? Well, you put your monocle on, and you're, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> and and um, your, your morning suit. Yeah, right. No, I mean, you spend, uh, you know, as an ambassador or at, you know, more junior levels in an embassy, um, you oftentimes spend most of your day outside embassy walls because you can't do your job unless you do that. With that comes a fair amount of risk. Um, you know, the most painful moment I think I can recall in the Foreign Service was when our four colleagues were murdered in Benghazi in September of 2012. And I was in Baghdad on another trip as Deputy Secretary of State at the time. And then I came and accompanied, you know, their remains, you know, back to Andrews Air Force Base in Washington. And I had known Chris Stevens, who was our ambassador then. He had worked for me in the past, a wonderful diplomat. And, you know, you're sitting there in this cavernous C-17 aircraft. And the only other things in that aircraft were four coffins with American flags on them. And, you know, that drives home to you that there's no such thing as a risk-free approach to diplomacy. So that's the most painful end. But most days, as ambassador in Russia, for example, I was out talking to Russians, you know, from Vladimir Putin on down, not just people in the Russian government, but I traveled widely in Russia, you know, across its 11 time zones, because you needed, you, if you were going to be an effective representative of your country, you needed Russians way outside the capital to see you as the embodiment of your country's interests. And I'd try to do, you know, television appearances, radio appearances, media appearances, you know, just to try to convey as best I could, you know, what Americans were about in Russia as well. So I spent a lot of time, you know, doing what I could to help create a level playing field for American businesses. That's a really important feature of what, you know, American ambassadors and other diplomats do overseas. You know, a diplomat spend a lot of time, you know, looking out for Americans who get in trouble overseas. And it's amazing the difficulties that Americans can get into sometimes. <laughs> One of the most depressing features when I was a younger officer, you know, is to make prison visits to Americans who had gotten arrested overseas because there's limits to what you can do to help. Um, and then you have, you know, when you're an ambassador, someone once described this to me as being the mayor of a small town. And there's a lot of truth to that in a way, because you have a big embassy community. When I worked in, you know, Moscow, we had something like 1,800, both Americans and Russians working at the embassy and our three consulates. And so you have to deal with all sorts of challenges, you know, everything from happy events like high school graduations um, to, you know, spousal abuse and, you know, drinking problems and everything else you'd run into as the mayor of a small town. So it was a fascinating life, um, you know, and I, I wish I could say I loved every moment of it, not every moment, but, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. And, you know, nothing will ever replace for me, you know, that sense of public service or the sense of camaraderie that comes with working with good people whom you know share that commitment as well. And that's why I think it's especially unfortunate in today's era in Washington that public service is so often belittled and demeaned. Well, on that note, and we are at the point of our last question, I wish we had more time. Um, you, you've talked about the hollowing of the Foreign Service <laughs> and the number of ambassadorial posts that are unfilled. So given those daily routines and the roles that you played, what is missing when we don't have ambassadors in various countries? What, what are the, what's the impact of having these roles empty? Well, part of it is symbolic. You know, a lot of countries, not surprisingly, see the absence of American ambassador as a sign that they don't matter so much to the United States. And I think that's deeply unfortunate. Um, good ambassadors overseas, um, you know, are also able to mobilize all the different instruments of American power to manage relationships, whether it's with adversaries and rivals or with allies and partners, in ways that serve American interests. And it's a lot harder to do if you don't have an ambassador there. People People will try to stand in, but it's not, it's not the same thing. People aren't going to be seen as the president's representative on the ground. Um, so at our best, and we're not always at our best, you know, in American diplomacy, you can accomplish an enormous amount 
um, through smart, dedicated ambassadors and you know teams of people in those embassies. And I think it's really, I've never seen anything quite like this where you're almost two and a half years into an administration. And for example, even in Washington, the State Department divides the world into six regions and each has an assistant secretary. Um, there are only two of those six positions today that are filled with people confirmed by the US Senate. And that's more than two years into an administration. Um, and, and that, that also is seen by lots of people overseas as a sign of lack of seriousness on the part of the United States and a kind of disdain you know, for the business of, of trying to work with other countries. Well, I hate to leave it on that note. I'd first, I'd first like to thank you for your service. Well, 33 years tilling the fields in diplomacy. Thank you for being there in all of those difficult situations. Really My appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Ambassador William Burns Pleasure. for joining us this evening. Thank you to our audience here in San Francisco, our audiences on the radio, TV, and the internet. Copies of Ambassador Burns' book, which is titled The Back Channel, are available for purchase. He'll be happy to sign copies in just a few moments outside. Again, thank you for joining us, and this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California is now adjourned. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Gloria. Thank that you. was really a pleasure. It's lovely. Thank